This hearing will come to order and without objection, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. I want to uh, welcome our two witnesses here today, uh, but I will now recognize myself for five minutes uh, to make an opening statement, uh, followed by the uh, other members on the panel. Today we're emphasizing the importance of uh, interest rates. In a free market, interest rates are crucial. It's, it's a crucial bit of information that tells a lot of people what to do, whether it's the investors, the savers, the spenders, uh, consumers, whatever. But once it is interfered with and interest rates are artificial, it tends to mess things up. We talk a lot about monetary policy and the soundness of the dollar and the spending and monetizing of debt. Today we're more or less concentrating on that aspect of monetary policy that deals with interest rates. How important is it? And uh, has, has that whole emphasis on interest rates uh, and this concession to the Federal Reserve that they have a duty and uh, sometimes an unregulated duty to pretend they know what the interest rate should be. And uh, this, this opens up a lot of questions. Uh, who benefits and who suffers from this? Has it done any good? Uh, is, is it a worthy uh, effort even to try to pretend that we know what interest rates should be and uh, figure out uh, exactly how much difficulty it has, has caused? Uh, from my viewpoint, I think that, uh, you know, from the viewpoint of the marketplace, uh, just as all prices, I want the market to set these prices. And we have been living now with a uh, Federal Reserve for 100 years, and, uh, you know, early on, uh, they uh, were manipulating interest rates. It's hard to manipulate the supply of money or be the lender of last resort without uh, getting involved in, in interest rates. And it's usually done with either trying to prevent a problem or to solve a problem. But if we, if we look at history, especially in our last hundred years, we've had a lot of ups and downs. It hasn't been smooth sailing. Uh, uh, the Federal Reserve is supposed to uh, be, uh, you know, providing for a sound dollar and making sure that uh, prices are stable and that there's high, uh, high employment. And yet, uh, this, uh, the results that we see today, because they have pursued this almost obsession on believing that they can uh, leap over into a, a central economic planning through the manipulation of money and credit and in particular interest rates, uh, we have ended up with some pretty poor results. Uh, so I, I am uh, un working under the assumption that we're in a period of time probably unparalleled in our history, possibly unparalleled in the history of the world, because it's, uh, we've never had quite the global economy involved uh, like we have today, and we've never had a single fiat currency uh, for 30, 40 years being used as the reserve currency of the world. So I think the distortions now are so great, and if it is indeed true that the concentration on interest rates might be the culprit, it'd be good to get it exposed so that uh, when the time comes when it becomes an absolute necessity to try to correct this problem, that uh, we might be able to put a better system together. So I am uh, delighted today that we've been able to uh, uh, bring two individuals that are very well versed on this subject to talk about this and other members of the, uh, uh, of the committee to emphasize the importance of price fixing of money. Some people don't like to call it price fixing and they refer to something of interest, but in a way it's easy to understand. It is, it is a price fixing and uh, if price fixing, price fixing is, is bad when we have uh, uh, wage and price controls. Everybody, not many people are advocating wage and price controls at the moment, even though there's a lot of that going on in a, in a subtle way. Uh, if, 
if money is one half, uh, if the currency is one half of every transaction and you have some price fixing uh, involved in the price of money, it can be a fairly significant event that should be exposed and we certainly ought to recognize that as we uh, move into that period of time when, when there's a, a necessity for monetary reform. So I am delighted that uh, uh, we've had this opportunity uh, to further this discussion. I would now like to uh, yield five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Walter Jones. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I won't take but a minute or two. And uh, I want to thank you again for your national leadership on this area of monetary policy and concerns of where this country is going. And to our witnesses today, thank you very much. I look forward to listening to your comments. And, and uh, I don't think there's a more a, a time when we're going home for the next five weeks, all of us in the United States Congress to be with the people. And knowing that I'm from Eastern North Carolina and the concern about the actions of the Federal Reserve. I think the topic today is absolutely fascinating and critical. So I just want to say to you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, thank you very much for holding this hearing, and I look forward to listening to the witnesses and thank them for being here. And uh, just thank you for your service to our nation. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I, I yield now time to Mr. Lucas from Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as all of the hearings that you have called in your tenure as a subcommittee uh, chairman reflect, this is an important subject matter and something that we all need to focus on. Perhaps not quite as exciting to the membership as one can tell as it should be, but nonetheless it cuts to the very, uh, the very basis of how our free market system works in this country. That said, let me reminisce for just a moment since the, uh, this session of Congress is beginning to wind down. And there's always a possibility this might be the last uh, hearing of this subcommittee. I, I suspect we might be around after Election Day, but lame ducks to be avoided if it's humanly possible. I would just simply note, uh, having sat next to you on this dais on the full committee for and served on your subcommittee for almost a decade now, uh, we've had many a, a good policy discussion, and not just monetary policy, but we've discussed uh, the intricacies of farm uh, farm policy, agricultural economics. Uh, it might surprise some of you to know that Dr. Paul and I, while we agree on many, many, many things, we're not exactly in sync on agricultural economics. But uh, we've had some lovely, very thoughtful, to the point discussions. And you've opened my mind in an area or two, and I appreciate that. And I hope perhaps uh, even uh, on a, an occasion or two, I've offered you a thought for you to think about uh, but you've just been a pleasure. And if uh, Congress is about uh, free elections and an open and a thoughtful debate process where policies can be formulated in the best interest of the country, uh, then uh, I think you have done your part, more than your part, and we'll all be ever so appreciative of that for many, many years to come. And with that, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman, and now I yield time to Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I add my uh, uh, congratulations and uh, empathies to uh, the chairman, uh, from uh, Chairman Lucas as well. It's been an honor to serve with you these past two years. Um, the subject we have today, I think, is extremely important from the standpoint that uh, uh, the Fed continues to tinker around with our economy through the money supply. And uh, from all things that I see, it's having minimal success. Uh, I'm concerned about the direction uh, that they're going, the, the situations they're putting us in. And when you look at the, the global situation, uh, other entities, central banks around the world, uh, they're struggling. And is this the proper uh, path to take? Uh, I don't know. I'm not an economist. And I, don't, I think there's a general good disagreement, even with good economists, on whether this is a good policy or bad policy. But I think that uh, the discussion is pertinent, uh, extremely important to today's uh, economic welfare from the standpoint that uh, we are in, in an economic uh, stagnation period here. And how do we get out of this uh, is, is everybody's concern. And uh, monetary policy by the Fed and uh, their, their, uh, their money supply policy, I think, is extremely important to uh, subject to discuss. So with that, I thank you for the uh, subject today, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Now I yield uh, time to Mr. Schweikert from Arizona. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very quick. Um, you know, you do realize you letting me on this committee has really screwed up my su subjects of reading over the last two years. All of a sudden, I find myself reading more about monetary policy than I ever thought I would want to touch, and I've learned a lot. Um, also, I've worked through a series of things that I, uh, I realize are just sort of complete folklore out there. And, Mr. Chairman, I'm hoping also in our testimony and, and in some of the discussion, um, I'm one of those who is absolutely fixated on the concept that interest rates ultimately are the pricing of risk. And um, the, where interest rates and capital flows and then that interest rate charge to where that capital flowed is sort of an allocation and a management of risk. And do you end up moving large amounts of capital, or even sometimes, you know, us as individuals, capital to places that it shouldn't be because it's misallocated and mispriced? And what are the ultimate consequences for what we've done here when we've uh, basically destroyed what should have been the historical pricing mechanism or risk mitigation, risk analysis system, which is interest rates in our economy? And with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony. Thank you, gentlemen. And we'll proceed now to our witnesses. Mr. James Grant is a noted investor and founder of the editor and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer, a widely circulated bi-monthly newsletter on finance that accurately foresaw the financial crisis. A former columnist uh, from Barron's, he is the author of five books on finance and financial history. Mr. Grant has appeared on television programs such as 60 Minutes and The Charlie Rose Show to share his expert knowledge of finance, and his journalism has been featured in numerous publications, including The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, and Foreign Affairs. Second, Mr. Lewis uh, Lehrman is a senior partner of the investment firm uh, L.E. Lehrman and & Company and is chairman of the Lehrman Institute, a public policy organization he founded in 1972, where he heads up the Gold Standard Now project. As a member of President Ronald Reagan's Gold Commission, Mr. Lehrman helped write the commission's minority report published separately as The Case for Gold. Over the years, he has written widely about economic and monetary policies and has been featured in Harper's, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, among others. Uh, without objection, your written statements will be made a part of the record. You will now be recognized for a five-minute summary of your testimony. Mr. Grant. Um, Mr. Chairman and committee, good morning. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure, and may I underscore point. honor uh, to be here. Uh, the price mechanism is our indispensable contrivance uh, without it, the store shelves would be stocked with things we don't want if they would be stocked at all. Our economy is wondrously complex. What coordinates the moving parts is Adam Smith's invisible hand. For a superb critique of the perils of price control, look no further uh, than Ben Bernanke's own lectures last March to the students of George Washington University. As you know, the chairman reminded his charges, prices are the thermostat of an economy. They are the mechanism by which an economy functions. So putting controls on wages and prices, here Mr. Bernanke was referring to the disastrous Nixon experiment of the early 1970s, meant that there were all kinds of shortages and other problems throughout the economy, close quote. Yet the same observant critic is today leading the Fed in a policy of financial price control, to call the thing by its name, Interest rates are, after all, prices. Uh, they convey information, or are intended to. Market-determined interest rates are the prices that balance the supply of savings with the demand for savings. Uh, these, however, are not our interest rates. Actually, we hardly have any. They're so small you can hardly see them. Um, they are tiny. Today, uh, the Federal Reserve imposes interest rates, and those rates it does not impose, it heavily influences. Mr. Bernanke's bank fixes at 0% the basic money market interest rate called the federal funds rate. It manipulates the alignment of rates over time, the yield curve, and it has its fingerprints all over the relationship between government yields on the one hand and the yields attached to private claims on the other. Uh, the Federal Reserve has decreed that ultra-low interest rates are a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for economic recovery. It says that miniature interest rates will boost hiring and another 
aspiration of the central bank, uh, keep consumer prices rising by just enough. A decent minimum, say, of 2% a year, so says the Fed. Now, every market intervention has consequences, but not necessarily the consequences that the intervening authority intended. In the nature of things, there can be no predicting exactly what will come of today's radical, indeed unprecedented, monetary policies. Mr. Bernanke himself makes no bones about it. In his widely scrutinized speech at Jackson Hole, Wyoming on August 31st, he used the phrase, quote, learning by doing. Indubitably, the Fed is doing. Nobody can doubt its manic energies, but it seems not to be learning. Artificially low interest rates must inevitably subsidize speculation at the expense of saving. It must raise up the prices of stocks and commodities, but only temporarily. It must enrich the asset holders and inadvertently punish the wage earner. It must advantage one class of financial institutions, say banks, over another, say life insurance companies. It must disturb the currency markets and therefore interfere with international trade. And, and it must conflate our understanding of the strength of the Treasury's own finances. This year, in the just ending fiscal year, or the soon to end, the interest cost and the debt will run to an estimated $225 billion. That happens to be slightly lower than the outlay the Treasury bore in 2006, when the debt was 58% smaller than it is today, but when the average interest rate was a towering 4.8% as opposed to the current average of 2.1%. Ultra-low rates flatter the nation's credit profile, yet that credit profile remains the same. Mr. Chairman, millions of Americans are earning nothing on their savings. Having nowhere else to turn, they are investing in richly priced corporate debt, some of that speculative grade. The Fed, author of this interest rate famine of ours, has inadvertently created a paradox that would be funny if it weren't dangerous. Mr. Bernanke's bank, has created a high yield bond market, junk bonds to the cognoscenti, but a market lacking one customary attribute of high yield securities. That is, the Fed has created a high yield bond market without the yield. I thank you. Mr. Lyman, go ahead. So Mr. Grant and I, I just wish uh, one sentence uh, to express how much uh, uh, we honor the extraordinary record of the chairman and his uh, 30 years of plus perhaps uh, service in the Congress. Uh, it has been a heroic effort on behalf of the authentic constitution and on behalf of the liberties which we've inherited from our forefathers and of course, for sound money. Now, um, uh, Mr. Grant is about six feet five inches. I'm only five foot ten, and, and he determined the protocol of our presentation. So uh, he established that he would uh, focus on the the problem, and and I should spend a moment or two on the solution. Uh, in, indeed, uh, Jim has described the consequences of Federal Reserve quantitative easing and interest rate manipulation and suppression. From Mr. Grant's uh, analysis, one concludes that the Fed's unlimited power to purchase Treasury debt and financial market securities not only funds the Treasury deficit with newly printed money, but the Fed's market intervention process also makes of the financial class a special interest group, a special interest group of privileged investors and speculators because of their special access to subsidize funds at near zero interest rates, while middle income families depend upon their credit card balances and pay upwards of 20% or more. A well-connected financial class subsidized by the Federal Reserve is a crucial cause of increasing inequality of wealth in America. In this regard, I cite only one fact for the Monetary Subcommittee to contemplate. Since the termination of dollar convertibility to gold 
in 1971, a mere generation, the financial sector has doubled in size as a share of the American economy. But the manufacturing sector has been cut in half. Only a comprehensive reform of the Fed and termination of the reserve currency role of the dollar will arrest this trend. For example, in 2002, Mr. Bernanke described the Fed's extraordinary power to create new money and credit in our present financial regime of inconvertible paper money and inconvertible bank deposit money. I quote, uh, I quote Mr. Bernanke, under a fiat paper money system, a government, the central bank, in cooperation with other agencies, should always be able to generate increased nominal spending and inflation. Even when the short-term nominal interest rate is at zero, the U.S. government has a technology, Bernanke continues, called a printing press, or today it's electronic equivalent, that allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. Reading this, I, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. In effect, as uh, James Grant wrote elsewhere, the Fed is not only the American central bank, but with this exalted power to print money, the Fed is now the government's central planner. During the vocal years, from 1979 to 1987, Fed interest rate manipulation was justified as the means to end inflation. By 1994, employment as a Fed target had all but disappeared from the minutes of Fed meetings. Now, in 2012, despite inflation being a gain on the rise, employment is, as a practical matter, the sole target of quantitative easing. The Fed and its apologists in the media and the academy justify quantitative easing and its unlimited scope and duration as the way to restore economic growth. Surely, an extra constitutional form of fiscal spending through Federal Reserve capital allocation reserved for the Congress of the United States. But so soon as one examines the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, which, if I may say so, few politicians do, one sees that the Fed primarily buys Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. In effect, a subsidy by which to finance the government deficit and to refinance bank balance sheets, that is to say, the promotion of more financial and consumption sector growth. In a word, quantitative easing is the most pernicious form of trickle-down economics. Now, the problem of the American economy is neither under consumption, nor is it under banking. The problem is the lack of rapidly growing investment in domestic production and manufacturing. Indeed, investment is the necessary means by which to enable our producers to lead in both domestic and global markets. It is rapidly increasing investment and production growth which begets employment growth, and with it, healthy, unsubsidized consumption growth, not by means of transfer payments. It is a truth of economic theory and practice that rising personal and family real income grows from increasing per capita investment in innovative businesses, new plant, new equipment. So the question is, in reforming the Fed, how can our runaway central bank be harnessed by the financial markets to target the goal of economic growth through increased productive investment, not the promotion of consumption and treasury deficit financing by means of interest rate manipulation and quantitative easing? The answer, I believe, is transparent. The Congress of the United States has the exclusive constitutional power under Article I, Sections 8 and 10, not only to establish the definition of the dollar, but Congress also has the power to define by statute the eligible collateral that the Federal Reserve may buy and hold against the issue of new money and credit. Thus, a simple congressional statute defining, 
defining sound commercial loans as the primary eligible collateral for discounts, and new credit from the Fed would have two primary effects. First, it should rule out Fed purchases of Treasuries, thus requiring the government to finance its deficits not with newly printed Fed money, but instead in the open market, away from the banks. Second, the Fed would then become a growth-oriented central bank by which to finance productive business loans, encouraging thereby commercial banks themselves to make loans to solvent businesses in order to sustain economic and employment growth. Now, why is this the case? Commercial banks would focus on production and commercial loans because solvent business loans, instead of Treasury debt, could then be used by commercial banks as the primary eligible collateral by which to secure credit from the Fed as the lender of last resort. In a word, Treasury subsidies by the Fed should be replaced, displaced, by productive business loans oriented toward economic and employment growth. Mr. Chairman, the simple propose, this simple proposed reform of Fed operations was the very monetary policy insisted upon by Carter Glass, a leading Democrat who was the chief sponsor of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. The congressional legislative leaders who created and founded the Federal Reserve System of 1913 designed the Fed by law to enable steady commercial investment and employment growth. The Federal Reserve Act was also designed explicitly to uphold and maintain a dollar convertible to gold in order to maintain a reasonably stable general price level. Now, such a congressional Federal Reserve reform today, consistent with the original Federal Reserve Act, would require no further legislative mandate to sustain employment growth and to rule out systemic inflation and deflation. Just one, a word more. So today, the Fed reiterates at every meeting that central bank, that it, the central bank, must manage and manipulate interest rates to fulfill a congressional mandate to maintain reasonable price stability and reasonably full employment. But the best way to do this is to remobilize the express intent and the techniques of the original Federal Reserve Act, namely the statutory requirement that the Fed uphold the classical gold standard, and as was intended by the original Federal Reserve Act, to substitute commercial market credit for Treasury debt as the primary eligible collateral for bank loans from the lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve System. Mr. Chairman, may I say, with respect, Congress has defaulted to the Federal Reserve System its sole and solemn constitutional authority to define and to regulate the value of the dollar and to define the vital economic use of eligible collateral by which to obtain productive business loans from the Federal Reserve System. It does not have to be this way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll go into the uh, questioning session right now. I yield myself five minutes. I want to uh, ask uh, both of you the same question. Um, in, in the 1979-1980s, we had a bit of a crisis, uh, quite different than we had today because interest rates were very, very high and even made higher. At that time, as I recall, not too many people were happy and claiming they were getting benefits from the higher interest rates. I don't think the markets, the higher the rates went, I don't think the markets were saying, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, but today, even, even with this most recent announcement of the accelerated quantitative easing, uh, there's almost an immediate response. Matter of fact, instantaneous response, we're gonna print a lot more money and uh, those individuals who are holding stocks uh, seem to be delighted with that and bonds rally. And, and um, my question is, is under today's circumstances with this constant effort to keep lowering interest rates, and now that they're down to essentially zero, uh, below zero when you uh, talk about real interest rates, 
who, who benefits from this? Who, who is really benefiting? And who are the people who are suffering? Can you divide it up and find out there's some groups that have no benefit whatsoever and some people actually get punished and other people are rewarded, uh, whether it's temporary or not, at least they think they're be re being rewarded. And if there is a case somebody benefits, somebody uh, is hurt, um, is, this, is this done uh, you know, on purpose or you know, would you, would you want to make a stab at it if they, is this sort of a consequence of just bad policy? Or what might be the motivation behind here if there are winners and losers? Uh, Mr. Grant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, the great uh, you know, French uh, economist Friedrich Bastiat uh, talked about that which is seen and that which is not seen. Uh, there are many obvious uh, beneficiaries. There are many obvious victims. Let me suggest a subtler distortion uh, that these policies are responsible for, and I'll, uh, then I'll touch on some of the ones that are perhaps as important or more so. Um, uh, capitalism uh, is a little like the forest floor. There is life, there is death, there is regeneration, there is movement. Um, uh, the famous phrase creative destruction defines the, uh, the inevitable ebbing of economic power that was once constructive and now has passed its prime. One of the consequences of these subsidized interest rates is that organizations that perhaps ought not to be around are given new life. Um, the, um, uh, the financial markets on Wall Street are increasingly welcoming to the most marginal credits because uh, there is a stampede for interest income. People are starving for it, and Wall Street is providing for it. Um, uh, when nearly anyone can get a new loan, when nearly anyone can get a pass in the public markets, that means there are not enough bankruptcies. Um, it is a problem, albeit a paradoxical one. We need new enterprise, and we need the exit of unprofitable or Sell by day, over the sell by date enterprise. So ultra low interest rates perpetuate the status quo. Uh, interest rates, as someone mentioned, are among other things, great sources of information. When interest rates are pressed to the floor, uh, the credit markets provide less and less information. Uh, the information is there, but is not to be intuited by prices. Uh, so as to the other benefits, beneficiaries and losers, uh, some of them are painfully obvious. The, um, uh, there is, you know, the, the Fed talks uh, more or less nonstop about inflation. The Fed, I think, is troubled by the lack of it. It wants to see more of it. Well, one department of American finance in which there is rampant inflation uh, is the cost of obtaining a dollar of income. Uh, one might say that the cost of retirement is, is in a terrific inflationary crisis. Um, um, a friend of mine and of Lou's, a Wall Street figure of wonderful renown and of some mordant humor, uh, said a while ago before he passed away, he said, you know, he said in all seriousness, he said, you really can't get by today without $100 million. <laughs> um, uh, the point survives the exaggeration. Uh, uh, you need uh, more and more capital to maintain a decent income as a saver. Uh, that, to me, is, the, is, is not the least of the costs of these policies. You know, uh, Chairman Bernanke in Jackson Hole uh, uh, spoke to try to put our collective minds at ease about the unintended consequences of quantitative easing. And he, could, he said, I can enumerate four possible pitfalls. Four. There are 400,000 possible pitfalls. Uh, the chairman, I think, is in error when he implicitly tells us that for every monetary cause A, there is a predictable monetary effect B. Uh, there are effects B, C, D, N, Z, and myriad effects that are so weird that no proper letter in the English language can describe them. What we are now embarked on is one of the great monetary experiments of all times. And Mr. Chairman, we are the lab rats. Mr. Lerman. Um, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the period of 1979, 1980, that 
that period of high interest rates um, over which uh, Mr. Volcker presided. And uh, I was there, and I remember it just as uh, you do. One of the remarkable things about a review of the history of the Federal Reserve System from 1914 until the present is that the techniques that have been used either the suppression of interest rates or the use of vaulting interest rates uh, to uh, bring about changes in econo economic activity uh, has seen uh, no, no, no reform. Uh, and that is to say, Paul Volcker, uh, um, you'll remember in 1979, said his goal was to target the bank reserves. That is to say, to control the stock of money in circulation. The, this was a, another new experiment on interest rate manip manipulation, of course, with a, a, a noble intent. But this was just another form of interest rate manipulation, which uh, ultimately wound up putting the prime rate at 21 percent and market rates for a long-term treasury at the highest levels that they had been in American history, approximately 15 percent. Uh, it is forgotten in the dreamlike uh, remembrance of that period that from 1979 to 1982, the American economy was in recession. The unemployment rate in New York State in 1982 in November, I remember that date very well for personal reasons, was 11.2 percent, higher even than the unemployment rate um, um, uh, at, at the peak of the Great Recession, which we've undergone since uh, 2008. It was not a halcyon period. Um, um, President Reagan's uh, first years of the administration were almost uh, uh, impeached economically because of that. So, uh, as the French say, the, mo uh, the more it changes, the more it is the same way. That is to say, Federal Reserve interest rate re manipulation and management for one purpose or another. Um, who benefits and uh, who suffers in each period uh, under e each of the Federal Reserve chairmen who exercise this extraordina uh, extraordinary power I is different. Today, um, I want to point out only uh, in response to the question, the technique and its effect by which the Federal Reserve actually does operate in open market operations at the New York Federal Reserve System and has done so since the First World War. The Federal Reserve enters the market and purchases outright or on a match sale or a, a repurchase agreement treasury securities from the market against which they issue new money. That new money is made available only to the banks because or the today 16 authorized dealers. So their portfolios are reduced and substituted with new money which they then are in a position either to lend out to dealers and brokers or speculators or uh, Wall Street investors who can post collateral, liquid collateral, by which they then can um, satisfy the, the lender that they can repay the loan. So the very first effect and the dominant effect, the generalized effect, is commodity dealers and mm, uh, equity uh, dealers who have first access to the money which is created anew by the purchase of treasuries which themselves cannot be repaid as they are refinanced with renewal bills. This is a prescription and has been in effect for a very long time, but especially since the end of the Second World War and even more dynamically since the end of Bretton Woods in 1971 to, to, enrich, to enrich the investor class. Uh, I, I cannot incriminate them because uh, to a certain extent I'm a member of that class, but it is, it, you, one does not have to be a rocket scientist to see that the Federal Reserve's process of monetizing the U.S. Treasury debt, providing new credit, credit to the banking system to lend to their preferred clients, divorces supply from demand, creating a monetary demand unassociated with the production of new goods and services. When total demand, when total monetary demand exceeds supply, which is the prescription and the technique of the Federal Reserve, inflation must get underway. Now, 
that inflationary process today is hidden by the vast unemployed, res unemployed resources which we now have. And as a, as a result, uh, it, the new credit money immediately goes into the commodity uh, and equity markets as well as into speculative vehicles like farmland, for example, which is the most exotic investment today of, of sort of inside Wall Street uh, investors. No, n no change can occur in such a process um, without a full reform of the Federal Reserve System and a, a reform of the monetary system. Thank you very much. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Lukemeyer for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Appreciate your comments, uh, Mr. Lerman. Those are um, uh, interesting. Um, you call farmland an exotic investment. I'm getting ready to, I'm looking to try and buy the farm that lays next to me, and I, I wouldn't think it would be an exotic investment, but I understand where you're coming from. Um, just kind of curious, uh, would, would, if the Fed would not purchase all of the government's debt, would there actually be a market out there, in your judgment, for our debt because of the size of, of uh, the debt that we have, the amount of money that it would take to service that debt? Uh, is there enough capital out there to purchase that if we don't run the printing presses here at the Fed and pick it up, in your judgment? May I first say, uh, Congressman, that I am the owner of a 1,600-acre farm, <laughs> corn, wheat, <laughs> soybeans. and. Uh, mm, it, it is exotic from the standpoint of speculators who've never set foot in a cornfield, but certainly not from uh, those. That's, that's who I'm bidding against on the farm right now, I, is, I, are, I, are those guys. So then you understand what I, what, yes, I, do. What I was getting at. To me, it's not exotic. I'd like to buy my neighboring farm, but to those folks, it, may, it runs the price up. I understand. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, um, so the question is, what would happen if as the founders of the Federal Reserve System intended that the Congress of the United States and the budget of the Treasury were not able to finance its deficits by selling securities ultimately to the Federal Reserve System. Is the market, is the open market uh, substantial enough mm -hmm. to accommodate uh, the vast sums presently required by the, by the um, the Treasury in order to finance its current uh, spending. The answer to that is we would find that out and it would be the ultimate discipline which would require Congress on notice to the public that the financing of the Treasury was forcing interest rates higher and higher and excluding um, businesses and commercial <coughs> firms from access to the credit markets because at the present level of deficits, let's call it uh, all in about a trillion and a half, including the Federal Financing Bank, bank it would absorb almost all the net national savings available for, uh, in, in the market. And, which gets right to the point of this hearing. What is the effect of the suppression of interest rates and their manipulation and the financing of 77% of the Federal Reserve's budget deficit in the fiscal year uh, 2011, what is the effect of that? It disguises from the public, um, the, the, the sovereign people, the effects of, uh, uh, of the fact that only 60% of the uh, revenues which Congress uh, decides to spend uh, are financed through taxes and 40% of them through printed money, either through the banks, the commercial banks, or foreign central banks. Well, I think there's another point to be made here, too, is the fact that because they're driving late rates so low, we're also disguising and hiding the fact that the exposure that we have when you go to $16 trillion worth of debt in just the la an additional four or five here, six in the last four, five, three or four years here, the amount of exposure we have to interest rate fluctuation. Right now, the cost of interest to our government is rather low compared to what it has been in the past because of driving interest rates down. If, the, if that would not happen, the rates would go back. and It would be very easy to double or triple the rates because they're so low right now. Imagine what it would do to our budget if you doubled or tripled our cost of funds. We dealt with that issue um, it would the last it. hearing, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, um, Congressman. We dealt with that issue, and were you to normalize the long-term interest rates, let us say for 30-year Treasury bonds, were you to normalize them consistent with uh, the past history of the, of the generation? And given the scale of the direct debt of the Treasury right now at 16 trillions, uh, the, the total amount of 
uh, the, the federal budget devoted to interest payments could rise to as high as $800 billion, even towards uh, $1 trillion if the deficit were to con continue. Uh, it, it's, um, that that, that uh, puts, I think, a number on, um, uh, on the effect. Very good. Um, very quickly, uh, also have, um, how, how do we unwind this? What happens when we unwind this thing? James. Mr. Grant. Um, well, we don't know. Um, the Fed is... Uh, We're still going to be a laboratory even for that. Yeah. That, too, will be a learning by doing experience. Um, the Fed How painful will it be, do you, do you think? Sorry? How painful do you think it will be? What cause will it have? Will, will interest rates rise? Will inflation take place? Are we going to a depression? Will it be runaway glory? Everything going to be hunky dory here? Or what? What? Where, where are we going? If, if, the, well, if we, the Fed has to unwind this thing and get rid of two point whatever eight, eight uh, trillion now, it's got on its balance. We can rule out, uh, Congressman, hunky dory. <laughs> uh, as to the rest, we'll see. Uh, yeah. uh, imagine uh, a day in which uh, uh, the Treasury to finance another trillion and a half dollar deficit is raising, say. Uh, $15 billion in two-year notes in the morning. In the afternoon, the Fed is holding a special auction uh, to liquidate the remaining excess portion of its balance sheet. So there'd be one auction on top of another. Um, I, we simply don't know the outcome, but we do know, I think, that, uh, uh, that the Fed's assurances must be discounted. The Fed is uh, remarkably complacent with regard to its capacity to form financial judgments. This is the outfit that panicked in front of the crisis of the computer co clocks in 1999, uh, neglected to see or to uh, take due uh, measure of the uh, speculative mania in technology stocks that ended in the early aughts and that positively saw not one aspect of the greatest credit crisis of three generations looming before it in the mid-2000s. And we are meant to believe that the perspicacity of the judgment of the Fed will now uh, help them anticipate the end of the necessity for this QE and to unburden themselves of the excess security. So I, I don't doubt that they mean to have the techniques to affect the exit. What I do doubt, and I think there is evidence in support of doubt, is that they have the judgment uh, to mark the time and the need. May I say but, a word on uh, that question, um, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Every Thursday evening at about 4 o'clock, the Federal Reserve System publishes its balance sheet. That balance sheet, as of Thursday night last night, um, I looked at it, it shows that to do it in round numbers, the Fed owns approximately $3 trillion of securities, primarily Treasury securities and mortgage securities mortgage-backed securities and agency bonds. If you look uh, further into the detail in the footnotes, you, you will observe that the largest fraction of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve System is in long-term securities. The historic practices of central banks uh, during long periods of stable prices was only to own short-term securities so that were inflation to arise, they could, to use your phrase, unwind their portfolio, selling securities or letting them uh, run off into the market in order to, uh, to reduce the quantity of money and credit in circulation and stabilize the price level. The Federal Reserve is now faced not only with the daunting task of unwinding the enormous um, uh, uh, monetization of treasury and mortgage-backed securities, but they have, en they have encumbered the balance sheet with long-term securities, which will not run off on a regular basis the way short-term commercial bills do uh, at, with 90-day maturities. They, they have the largest fraction, of, far and away the dominant fraction, in uh, 10 to 30-year securities. So the only way they can get rid of them is to sell them into the open market. If the, mar if the economy is running full tilt at full employment, and uh, uh, let us say the unemployment rate might be at 5%, it could, have no, it could have nothing less than a, as you implied, a very dynamic effect on uh, interest rates in general, not just in the United States, but worldwide, in as much as the United States dollar is the world reserve currency. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. 
We'll go into a second round of, of questioning. Uh, the uh, first question I have, I'd like to get sort of a short answer because I have another question that follows and we'll be voting on the floor pretty soon. But uh, what, what is your concept of the current situation now and whether or not we have a bubble? Most of us recognize a NASDAQ bubble. Others recognize the housing bubble. Do you see a bubble right now that could suddenly change and change the markets and all perceptions, uh, Mr. Grant? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. And I see a bubble in, uh, in Treasury securities. I see a bubble in uh, sovereign debts worldwide. The world has come to believe uh, that uh, the, 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 the promises to pay of sovereign governments are intrinsically safe. Not everyone, but uh, uh, Northern European governments are meant to be intrinsically safe. Australia, there, I think there are seven or eight triple A rated governments left on the face of the earth. People are crowding into the claims of these governments, uh, not least into our own. Uh, these are interest rates that are, have not been seen in modern times. In Northern Europe, there are plenty of governments borrowing at negative interest rates. And with a case in every single market bubble in history, there are wonderfully persuasive stories circulated to rationalize what on the face of it is an abuse of common sense. So I nominate uh, bonds themselves as our looming bubble. Mr. Lerman, any additional comments? Well, the, bu uh, the number of bubbles, even with vast unemployed resources in, in, the, in nations around the world, and not just in the United States, the, the number of bubbles are legion. And uh, Jim has just mentioned some, but the congressman and I were talking about farmland. The, uh, the value of farmland as one vehicle for speculation, uh, uh, not only among uh, well-positioned uh, farmers, but I mean to say the, the investor class, uh, uh, the price of farmland, high quality, let's say 160 bushel per acre, non-irrigated farmland from, the, from central Pennsylvania all the way to the uh, foothills of the Rockies, that is to say the Great Corn Belt, um, has doubled just in the past four years. Uh, this, this has never been experienced at quite this, this, uh, this rate of change, or I should say uh, this, this bubble has never uh, occurred at, on this scale in the past. Just one more example. My follow-up question is, is to, to you, Mr. Lehrman. I would like Mr. Grant to comment as well. You talked about a long-term solution, more about the monetary reform and the use of gold. Uh, I want to concentrate more on that shorter range uh, solution or something you suggest that could help, and that is to look to the original Federal Reserve Act and not to allow the Fed to buy treasury bills, but to allow the Fed to be the lender of last resort to uh, sound commercial loans. Is, is that did I state that correctly? Exactly. Okay. Um, if the Fed buys a commercial loan, they could buy this with uh, money creation. Would this, be, would this be expanding the money supply? Would this be monetizing a debt? Uh, and could it lead to a problem as well? Or would this uh, automatically, or, or would you argue that this is, is not uh, monetary inflation? It, 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 I would argue uh, it would not be monetary inflation. The difference, and the difference is, uh, uh, it pr is profound. The, the purchase of commercial bills um, for, the per for the purpose of production by the Federal Reserve or by commercial banks against the issue of new money goes to solvent firms who in the process of production then sell their output and they repay the loans. Uh, and as a result, the the new credit which has been advanced against a commercial bill or against a productive loan expands the money supply during that particular market interval. But 90 days later or 120 days later, the goods that were used to, that, that were produced as a result of that financing uh, uh, realize their value and then those loans are, are liquidated, restoring equilibrium uh, to the money market. So do you separate this from being the lender of last resort or would you put it in that category? Well, I use the phrase lender of last resort because that is, of course, the rationalization that, uh, that, uh, that everybody uses uh, to give the Fed uh, the, the, the privileges to um, create money without limit. Uh, as the lender of last resort, 
um, the, the Fed would have the possibilities of buying commercial, solvent commercial loans in the open market, which themselves would be liquidated uh, in, in a wind-up uh, naturally in, in the course of, um, of um, economic activity. Whereas in the, the, in the case of the Treasury, the Treasury is never able, under present circumstances, and has not been since pretty much the end of the Second World War, to liquidate the bills or the bonds which they are selling. And it leads to a permanent expansion of the money supply, never to be unwound by natural the natural course of production. Would, by doing this, would this interfere with interest rates? Uh, in the case of commercial bills or productive loans, which the Fed would then discount as, uh, it, when they were offered to by the commercial banks against uh, the de desire for new uh, credit, this would, um, in the same sense, lead to a rise in interest rates when credit demands were higher and a fall in interest rates when the commercial loans were being repaid to the commercial banks and the commercial banks uh, repaying the central bank um, for the loans that they, that they obtained against commercial lending collateral. Okay. And uh, our, our voting started, but I'd like to get uh, Mr. Grant to make a, make a comment on that if he could. Um, I would vote. I'm with Lou. Pardon me? I, I said I would go vote. I'm with Lou on this. I can't uh, add to this or, or, or shouldn't okay. take your time in adding to it. Okay. Um, Mr. Heisenkin from Michigan, do you care to make some questions? Yeah, and uh, I do also, Mr. Chairman, I want to say thank you for your uh, service to our country and, and uh, uh, your time here in Congress. and. Uh, as well as your service to the philosophy, the the, the battle that we have going on. And um, uh, the question I have is I'm curious if you can touch on the dual mandate of the Fed and what you, know, what you believe that may have done to get us in the current situation. Uh, and would you suggest us changing that dual mandate of uh, you know, having them pursue low inflation and high employment uh, and uh, and any time I have, I'd like to uh, give back to the to the chair if he uh, if he so desires to do a follow up. Um, Congressman, I I think that uh, uh, one might again go back to the to the founding precepts of the Fed. The the, the Fed got into business, um, uh, and if you if you read the opening paragraphs of the Federal Reserve Act, uh, it was to the Fed was to uh, create a market in commercial bills and to. Uh, uh, and to uh, exchange uh, 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 paper for gold in such a way as to support the workings of the gold standard. And, and it, the phrase added was, and for other purposes, pregnantly it was added. Um, but I would keep the mandate even simpler than one. I would say that the, the Fed ought to be in business to, uh, uh, to support an objective definition of the value of the dollar. In this day and age, um, uh, we could not have anything resembling uh, industrial commerce as we know it without the most precise uh, specifications of material uh, weights and measures. Uh, and uh, somehow we have neglected this in money. Money is what uh, someone thinks it should be in some particular public institution, like a central bank or a treasury department. Uh, the lead article of the Financial Times this morning was a plaint by the finance minister of Brazil against quantitative easing on the grounds that the, the, the willful depreciation of the dollar, or when I say the willful redefinition of the dollar, uh, would certainly lead to the interruption of trade and to frictions that did not exist previously. Um, so I, uh, uh, the gentleman to my left has written a fabulous book on this, and I think it's his view as well that, uh, that what is wanted is, is the restoration of objective value in the dollar. And if the Fed could do that and maintain it, um, it seems to me that good things would follow. As it is, we have arrived at a most peculiar point in which people have come to think that if the Fed can raise up the value of stocks, bonds, farmland, and commodities, somehow prosperity will follow. It seems to me that is a very peculiar horse in front of a very odd cart. All right, I appreciate that, and Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to yield my time to you. I, I thank you. Uh, I'll recognize uh, uh, Mr. Lukemeyer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly, I have only got a couple of questions. Um, uh, Mr. Grant, what do you believe would be the ideal interest rate or the ideal uh, range that the Fed should shoot for that our rates should be for like our T-bills or Fed funds rates or home loan or, or somewhere in there? Well, some, use some of those um, figures, Well, please. sir, I, I, I think the Fed should not be shooting at those rates. I think that they should be determined uh, uh, in the marketplace, I, if you look back in history, a, a kind of a normal mortgage rate was four and a half to five percent. Um, T-bill rate maybe three to four uh, percent. Long-dated securities yielding perhaps six to seven percent, depending on the credit, uh, and higher with regard to junk or speculative-grade credits. Um, but I, I would, I would, uh, I would, I would let the uh, the wonderfully invisible forces of the marketplace into this line of work and let them do their thing. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then would you, would you get rid of the Fed, or do you think there's a place for it? Sir? Would you get rid of the Fed then, or do you believe that there's a place for it? Um, uh, I believe that the Fed ought to be doing much less than what it's doing, and it could do with many fewer economists. It could be do, doing with a much narrower mission statement and uh, it should, uh, as long as we're talking about reforming this outfit, we should not fail to institute the Fed's first Office of Unintended Consequences. Mr. Lerman, would you like to comment on that? Do you believe we need to have the Fed, or do you believe I, we need I, to arrange? I have I made the case uh, in my book, or in, in previous books, that if we are going to have a Federal Reserve System, uh, for it should be said it is not an indispensable necessity. But if we are going to have a mere agency of the Congress, maybe with the, statue, the stature, so to speak, of the Interstate Commerce Commission or the Federal Communication Commission, then it must be circumscribed by uh, very careful rules whereby uh, it conducts its policies such that it is consistent with the activities of a free market and a free okay. people. So that, uh, yes, I can, I can embrace the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 and the very few moments uh, in which it conducted itself according to Article I uh, of the Constitution, Sections 8 and 10, namely, to define the value of the dollar, regulate the, uh, the, the, val uh, regulate so, the so value. So you, you could live with it as long as it went back to where it was, it was original intention and function. I think and, and we function. can go Pardon. forward. We have to go, we can't go backward, but I yeah. think we can go forward to a restoration of a Federal Reserve System which operates with some uh, uh, restraints imposed by Congress, uh, the definition of the collateral which is el eligible mm -hmm. at the Federal Reserve for discount against new money to encourage economic growth as opposed to encourage uh, uh, Treasury budget deficits. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank our uh, uh, members here today and our testimonies and I appreciate very much you being here. I would like to adjourn this hearing.